So up to now, we've covered to test one, electricity, up to test two, electromagnetism. Now we're going to begin the third part of the course in which we're going to cover uh, light and matter and we're going to cover space and time. So all those four topics, light, matter, space and time, are packed into this last third of the class. Actually, we'll spend about a half of it on light and then the other half of it on the, the remaining topics. So the next six lectures, I think, are all about light, about the properties of light. Today's class is, um, is we're going to cover, uh, we're going to introduce the properties of light. Uh, I'm going to start with just one slide where I'm going to talk about the um, uh, wave-like and particle-like properties of, of light. So I'm just going to make some remarks, some comments there. And then we're going to um, move on and talk about specifically what's called geometrical optics, and we're going to talk about light's propagation, we're going to talk about light's reflection, and we're going to talk about light's refraction. And we'll, we'll illustrate the propagation, the reflection, the refraction of light. And we'll um, look at some examples of the propagation, the reflection, and, and refraction of light. So that's the basic plan. Okay, so this is just one slide of kind of background on the, um, the nature of light. If you went back 400 years to the time of Newton, there was a big debate about whether light was a wave or light was particles. And actually, Newton argued that light was particles based on reflection like a stream of tennis balls or a stream of bullets bouncing off uh, a surface. That's his picture of reflection, so light was particles. Another famous scientist at the time, a Dutch scientist Huygens, argued that w light was a wave, not, not a particle. Uh, his argument was based on that if you shine light through a pinhole, the emerging light spreads out like a, like a wave, like a sound wave or a water wave. So he argued for waves. And um, so that there was this big fight between Newton and Huygens, and there was no resolution of that. It, it was undecided whether light was particles or waves. Later on, if you came up to the um, 1800s, if we move forward to the 1800s, there were experiments that actually demonstrated Firstly, unequivocally, that light was a wave. And then there were experiments that demonstrated unequivocally that, that light was a particle. So there's a famous experiment by um, a scientist called Young who demonstrated through observation of light's interference that light must be a wave. And then there was a, uh, a, a famous experiment by a scientist we've met, Hertz, who demonstrated the collisions of light particles with electrons, and therefore that light was unequivocally a, um, a particle. The whole resolution of that story is due to Einstein, and it's actually that light is really neither simply a wave or simply a particle. Light is something different. Light is something that exhibits both wave-like characteristics, but also particle-like characteristics. So it's something completely new that we don't see in our everyday world. In our everyday world, we either see things are like particles or things are like the waves. But light has both wave and particle-like properties. It exhibits both of them. It's a new kind of thing, a new kind of stuff or, or substance. And that was due to... Um, due to Einstein. There's an equation, there's one equation on this slide. It's this little guy here. This is an energy of a particle, a particle of light. This is the frequency of a light wave. And this is the relationship between the particle-like properties of light, like its energy, and the wave-like properties of light, like its frequency. And they're related through this number 
or this constant, this constant of nature. This constant of nature is called Planck's constant. It's written out here. And so this is the bridge. This is the kind of bridge between these two characteristics, these two features of light, that it does have wave-like and particle-like properties. Okay, so um, that was just some remarks, some introduction, and keep that in mind as we walk through the next five or six lectures on light, because we're going to be seeing cases where what light is behaving like a particle, light is behaving like a wave. In today's class, I'm going to really focus though, on introducing some, some basic properties of light. It's propagation, it's reflection, it's refraction. So we're going to be talking about I'm getting really scared to stand in this spot because the microphone is going crazy. Um, we're going to be talking what's, about what's called geometrical optics. Uh, and in geometrical optics, we use light rays to sketch the uh, path of the light. And uh, this slide is just to introduce that idea of using light rays to describe the path of light. It might be the path of light uh, through um, a, a glass plate. It might be the path of light through when reflected from a mirror. It might be the path of light when passing through a lens. So rays, ray tracing is how we draw, how we sketch the path of light. Um, so we draw these arrows here these horizontal arrows here. These are indicating the uh, path of the light rays. These are indicating the uh, direction of the light rays. They show the propagation of the light rays. If we were to imagine a particular plane, a particular surface on these light rays, so there's a plane here on the left, plane here in the center, plane here on the right, then on each of those three planes, say this plane here on the left, everywhere if we were to think of the, um, the waves of light, they would have the, um, the same amplitude of the waves of light, the same uh, what we call phase of the wave of light. And so this would be a wave front, like an ocean wave or like a sound wave. This picture of rays, this way of imagining light as, as rays of light, works well works well if the wavelength of the light is um, much smaller than the um, uh, dimensions of, say, the mirror that you're shining the light on, or the dimensions of the lens that you're shining the light through, or the glass plate that the light is tra traversing. So if the wavelength of the light is much, much smaller than the lens or the mirror or the plate of glass, then this ray picture of light works well. And that's true for visible light, right? Visible light has wavelengths that are from 400 nanometers to um, 700 nanometers, so it's smaller than a micron. The size of a lens, the size of a mirror, the size of a window is much bigger than the, the, the wavelength of, of visible light. Uh, this doesn't work well for radio waves. Ray tracing doesn't work well for radio waves because radio waves, they have wavelengths of meters or tens of meters or even thousands of meters. Uh, and so in general, um, the uh, wavelength of the radio waves is much, much larger than, say, some optical instrument like a lens or a mirror or a plate of glass. So that's a case where ray tracing doesn't work. Okay, so I'm going to give you three rules for propagation, reflection, refraction of, of light. And uh, these are the three rules for propagation, reflection, refraction that are going to guide us as we um, look at ex examples of, of light passing through different optical instruments in different optical situations. So the first one is the one for the law of propagation of light. And the law of propagation of light just says that light travels in a straight line. Light travels in a straight path. 
So um, if light is traveling from over here on the left, this point P, to over here on the right, this point Q, light will travel in a sta straight line from P to Q. Now, there, there is a comment I should make for that straight line path. That straight line path is a straight line path if the medium, the material, the substance between the point P and the point Q on the left and the right, if it's uniform. So if the medium between P and Q was not uniform, the light might not travel in a straight line, but through a uniform medium, through a uniform material, light travels in, in a straight line. And that's, so that's a basic rule. Uh, that we'll use when ray tracing, that light will travel in a uniform medium in a, in a straight line, in a straight path. That's a very ancient discovery, right? Uh, if you went back, if we went um, back 2,000 years to the Greeks in Athens, right, they knew that light traveled in a straight line. They also knew how light was reflected from a surface. And so this is the rule for reflection of light rays from, from a surface. So um, in this picture here, um, this horizontal line represents the boundary between two different media or two different materials. So it might be the boundary between, say, upstairs air and downstairs water. Or it might be the boundary between air and glass. Or it could even be like the boundary between water and glass. So it's just the boundary between two different media that have two different um, optical properties. Over here on the top left, a light ray is heading towards this air, glass, air, water boundary. It strikes the air, glass, air, water boundary here, and it is reflected back off the air, glass, water boundary, back into the material, the medium that it arrived from. So it started in air, say, reflected off the glass, ended up in the air. Started in air, reflected off the water, ended up in air. This vertical line here is what we call the normal. It's the normal to the boundary. It's the normal to the interface between the two materials. So it's at 90 degrees, at right angles, to the, the surface that's bounding the two materials. And the, the law of reflection says that the incident angle measured to that normal is equal to the reflected angle as measured from that normal. So you see that here. Here's how we describe the incident direction of the light ray with the incident angle theta i. We're measuring it from the normal, the number of degrees from the normal. Here's how we measure the reflected angle uh, of the light ray. We're again measuring it from the normal, the number of degrees from the normal. And the uh, law of reflection says that the reflected angle here, the outgoing angle, is equal to the incident angle here, the incoming angle. That's simply the law of reflection. It's, it's that straightforward, that simple. Theta i equals theta r. Now, again, there, I should be a little bit careful. This is for a, um, what we call a specular surface, so a particular type of surface, a, a mirror is a specular surface. A um, glass window is a specular surface. That's where you get um, this law of reflection, where the incident and reflected angles are the same. In other cases, you get what we call diffuse reflection. In diffuse reflection, the reflected angle isn't in equal to the incident angle. The reflected angle is all sorts of angles. The light is reflected in all sorts of directions. So this law of reflection applies to specular reflection off a mirror, off a, off a glass plate, uh, off a polished surface, but uh, it doesn't apply to um, uh, diffuse reflection. This is just a picture to show you <coughs> specular reflection over here on the left and um, diffuse reflection over here on the right. 
So in both of these cases, we got the car's headlights. Both of these cases, we're seeing reflection off a roadway. This is the reflection of the headlights off the roadway on the left. This is the reflection of the headlights off the roadway on the right. But there's a difference. This is a wet roadway, a wet surface. This is a dry roadway. And you see more, more specular reflection here and less specular reflection here. You see the image of the two headlights more clearly here, less clearly over here, because here there's more light that is undergoing the specular reflection with theta i equals theta r. Over here there's less light that's undergoing the specular reflection where theta i equals theta r. Okay, the final law is called the law of refraction. So this law applies not to reflection where light bounces off a medium between two surfaces and returns to the original material. It's where the light crosses the medium between two surfaces and enters a new material. So again, in this picture, where we're describing the law of refraction now, rather than reflection, we've got a horizontal line. And that horizontal line is the boundary between these two different materials. So again, it could be that it's air and water. It could be air and glass. It could be glass and water and, and so on. It's just two different optical materials. In this case, I've added a number, this n subscript i here, this n subscript r here, that's actually going to describe the optical pro properties of the two materials. So this number, ni, nr, is called the refractive index. And it is the number that characterizes the optical nature of, say, the air, the glass, or the water. So air has a particular refractive index. Water has a particular refractive index. Glass has a particular refractive index that characterizes the air, the glass, the water's optical, optical characteristics. So that's, that's what this new number is here. And we need this new number when we're describing refraction, the light traveling from one medium to another medium. We didn't need this number when we described reflection, where light um, bounced off another material but stayed in the original material. OK. So here comes the incoming light ray from some point P. And here it's the outgoing light ray heading towards point Q. Again, we measure or describe or indicate the directions of the incoming light ray, the outgoing light ray, by measuring their directions with respect to the normal. This line, again, is the normal. It's 90 degrees right angles to the surface. We measure the incident angle with respect to that. I've called it theta i again. We measure the refracted angle with respect to that. It's theta r here. So the law of reflection, refraction, a little bit more complicated, but not much more complicated. It says that if in the incident medium and if in the refracted medium, so the medium upstairs and the medium downstairs below the boundary, if you, in those two media, you multiply the refractive index, so it would be the ni or the nr, by the sine of the incident or reflected angle, so it would be by sine theta i or sine theta r, then that product of refractive index and sine of angle, that's actually the same in the incident medium and in the refracted medium. So I've written that equation here, look. So this is the product ni sine theta i. This is the product of the refractive index and the sine of the angle in the incident medium. Everything on the left here is in the incident medium. This is the same product ni, the refractive nr, the refractive index sine, times the sine of the refracted angle in the re refracted medium. Everything here is about the refracted medium. And the law of refraction is that these two products are the same. And so that's how we describe the bending, the refraction of the light rays from, from one medium to another medium. Um, again, I should make the comment that this applies to certain surfaces, certain materials. So 
<coughs> this applies to what we call like specular reflection, specular refraction, where the light traveling from one medium to another medium is just bent by a given angle. And it's given by this law, which we call Snell's law. Uh, there's also diffuse refraction. That's where light is traveling from one medium to another medium, and it's bent in many different directions. And so there's no law for that, and, and that's the diff diffuse refraction. So this, this Snell's law here applies to um, specular, specular refraction. Unlike, um, so the Greeks knew about propagation of light rays in the straight line. They knew about the reflection of light rays, that the reflected and incident angles were the same. The Greeks never knew about this law, Snell's law, for um, uh, refracted light rays. This came, you know, for them, nearly 2,000 years later. So this is a much, much more modern law. And this law required trigonometry and signs and that sort of mathematical understanding. So this is a really modern law compared to the laws of propagation and reflection. This is a table I took from the book. Um, and I wanted to make a couple of points here. So all optical materials have a characteristic refractive index that is a, a characteristic of them that particular optical material. And so in this table here, it's just a big list of different materials, different optical materials, you know, glass, etc., uh, and their refractive indices. So you can see the values of the refractive indices. Refractive indices are just numbers. So they don't have dimensions, they don't have units, they're, they're just numbers. And they're, uni they're numbers that are bigger than one. Sometimes they're only just fractionally bigger than one. And sometimes they're quite a bit bigger than one. And they reflect, for example, how much light is bent when you travel from one medium to another medium. Um, as some examples, uh, look, air. Air is an optical medium. Light travels through air. Its refractive index is very, very, very close to one. It's just fractionally bigger than one. It's just fractionally different from empty space. So 1.0003 is a refractive index of air. If you look at um, water, right? Light travels through water. Water is an optical medium. The refractive index of water is 1.333. So it's somewhat bigger than, um, bigger than one. If you look at something like diamond, so diamond, the characteristic of diamond, why diamond's part of jewelry, is that it has a super high refractive index. So it has a very large refractive index, which causes actually light to be trapped in the diamond and the diamond to kind of glitter. And so that's the, why diamond is part of jewelry because of its very high refractive index. Anyway, this is a table of all sorts of materials, all sorts of refractive indices that carries, characterize their, their optical properties. There's one point I wanted to make up here. We said that light travels at the speed of light at 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. We said that from the last class before spring break. Three times 10 to the 8 meters per second is the speed of light. That's true in vacuum. That's true in empty space that the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. In materials, in optical materials like the air, like the, the water, like the glass, like the diamond, light actually travels slower. And it travels slower by a factor that is the refractive index. So in air, light will travel slower by a factor of 1.0003. So it's slightly slower than 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. In water, light will travel slower by a factor of 1.333. So it's significantly slower than 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And in diamond, right, diamond has a refractive index of about 2.4 or 2.5. Light travels a lot slower in diamond than the 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So that's another 
place where the refractive index is important in how fast, how slow the light travels in that material. This slide is a little busy, um, but it's going to make a few points about um, a comparison between the wavelength of light, the frequency of light, the speed of light, in empty space, in vacuum, and the wavelength of light, the speed of light, the frequency of light in, um, in some material. And so that's what I'm comparing on here. So on this slide, um, when you see a lambda, that's wavelength. And without a subscript, it's the wavelength in empty space. When you see an F, that's frequency, and when you see an F without a subscript, that's the frequency observed in um, empty space, vacuum. And then when you see um, C, that's the speed of light in empty space. That's the speed of light in, um, in vacuum. When you see like lambda 1, F1, and um, uh, V1, that's the wavelengths, the frequencies, and the speeds in a material that has a refractive index N1. And when you see the, the lambda 2, the F2, uh, the, the V2, that's the uh, wavelengths and the frequencies and the speeds in the material that has a refractive index N2. So the main point on this slide is that these three points here. So the first point is that um, in materials, the speed of light changes. And it changes according to this little rule here. So if you're in material number one, with refractive index N1, the speed will be V1, which is the speed of light in vacuum, empty space, C, divided by the refractive index. If you're in medium number two, right, the speed of light in med medium number two we call it V2, is the speed of light in vacuum, or free space again, divided by the refractive index of that material, N2. So this is where the speeds are slower according to the refractive indices of the material. So if this was air, it'd be a little bit slower in material number one. If this was diamond, it will be a lot slower in material number two. So that's a comment on the speeds. What about the wavelengths? So the wavelengths also changes when light travels from vacuum to a medium like air or water or glass or diamond. The wavelength is also changed and the wavelength is also shrunk by, decreased by that factor of the refractive index. So lambda is the refractive index in free space, in, in vacuum, and in the material number one characterized by the refractive index N1, the wavelength is smaller, shorter, by this factor N1. In material number two, imagine that's diamond. So the wavelength is shorter in diamond of the light ray than it is in vacuum by a factor of the refractive index of the diamond. So it'd be quite a bit shorter. So the wavelength also shrinks just like the um, speed shrunk. What doesn't shrink, and that's point three here, is actually the frequency. So the frequency in, of a light ray in, in vacuum, the frequency of the light ray in air, in, in water, glass, in diamond, is actually exactly the same. So the frequencies are the same. It's just the, um, the, the speeds and the wavelengths that shrink. All that is actually consistent with, you might remember that equation that relates the um, the wavelength of a uh, light ray, the frequency of the light ray, and the speed of the light ray. We, we, we met it in the last class before spring break. It was C equals lambda F. So that's a relationship between the speed of the wave and the wavelength and frequency of the wave. That equation holds, that equation is still valid in a material. In place of the, the, the C, the space, the speed in vacuum or empty space, you've got the speed in the material, so it'd be a V1 or a V2. 
in place of the wavelength in vacuum, the lambda, you've got the wavelength in the material, be a lambda 1, a lambda 2. In place of the frequency, well, in place of the frequency, the frequency doesn't change. So f is the same as f1 as the same as f2. So the equation v1 equals lambda 1 times f, that still holds. That relationship still holds. The equation v2 equals lambda 2 times f. That will still hold. That's still valid. So the relationships between the wavelengths and the frequencies and the speeds still hold with these changes of the wavelengths and the speeds in different materials like diamond, like air. Okay. Let's try and demonstrate this. Um, I've talked about, talked about three talks about three different topics, the propagation, the reflection, and the refraction. So I want to show you a demonstration of the, the laws of um, propagation, reflection, and refraction. Um, so the, the first one is going to be just propagation. So what I've got here is a laser, and I've got three pinholes in a row. And um, I'm going to shine the laser on the screen, and um, to get to the screen, it must be that the pinholes are lined up and the laser is lined up, so the light must go in a straight line. I want to show you reflection and refraction. So I, I got a second demonstration here with, um, with, a, with a laser. So this one's going to be a green laser. And I'm going to shine the laser through the air onto this is a little fish tank brought from home. And I'm going to shine it onto the surface of this water here. And so, well, what's that? That's, that's going to be a case where there's going to be some reflection of the surface of the water in accord with the law of refraction. There's also going to be refraction as the light moves into the water. And so that there's going to be a refraction, a bending of the light rays according to the law of refraction. So when you see the, the, the laser light, you're going to see it both reflect and refract off this surface here. And so you can see the angles of reflection and refraction and think about the laws of reflection and refraction. Actually, in this case here, we're going to re there's a mirror inside the fish tank. So we're going to reflect the light off the bottom of the fish tank, and then the light is going to come out through the... Um, the, the water surface again. And so when it comes back out, you'll also see reflection of the light there, where it stays inside the water, and refraction of the light there, where it bends as it comes out of the light. So you're going to see two examples where the light enters the water, where you've got reflection and refraction, and when the light comes out of the water, you've got, actually got reflection and refraction there. Um, I brought in my hairspray from home to demonstrate this, this one. Um, because we need to see the laser light. And I've got to switch the light off again. I don't know where the light is. Okay, so at this point, I've introduced the three laws for the propagation, the reflection, and the refraction of light rays. And I wanted to look at um, some examples, some illustrations of reflection and refraction of light rays. So the, the rest of the class is really going to be a, about illustrations and, and examples of the laws we've met. I've got a quiz question to start with. In this quiz question, we have a light ray uh, that's approaching a boundary between two different media. So over here, label one is the medium that the light ray is starting in. And over here, medium two, this is the light ray, the medium that the light ray is entering in. And you've got to determine from that picture uh, which medium has the, the larger refractive index. Or do they have the same refractive index? OK, maybe I'll get going again. Um, so we've got light that's traveling from the left to the right. The angle of incidence on the left, so that's the angle with respect to the normal, is larger. The angle of incidence on the right, measured with respect to the normal, that's, that's smaller. 
So theta i, the incident angle is bigger. Theta r, the refracted angle, is smaller. The sine of theta i is, is therefore bigger. If the angle's bigger, the sine of that angle is bigger. The sine of theta r is smaller. If the angle's smaller, the sine of theta r is, is also smaller. So if the sine of the angle is bigger on the incident medium, the left, and the sine of the angle is smaller on the uh, refracted medium, on the right, then to make Snell's law, to build Snell's law, it must be that when you multiply by the refractive indices on the left and the right, multiply the sines of the angles by the refractive indices, the sine on the left is smaller because the sine of the angle is bigger. The sine on the right is larger because the, um, the, the, the sine of the angle was smaller. So over here, the refractive index must be larger. Over here, on the left, the refractive index must be smaller. And that's because this process, this transit of the light rays, is described by the law of refraction. OK, now I've got a few quantitative examples of, um, of refraction and reflection and propagation. Um, today's class, I'm not going to work any of these out on the, um, the device I don't know the name of. Um, and that's because uh, to work them out on the device that I don't know the name of, I would have to make sketches of the light rays. And um, I tried this out. I was incapable of making these sketches carefully enough to make it, it worthwhile anybody being in the room. So we're going to work from my slides today. But I'll go back to my um, uh, device that I don't know the name of next, next class. Okay. Well, if you, you weren't born when this happened. I, I was more than bored when this happened. <laughs> uh, the lunar landing. I, I re literally still remember I was in um, what would here be mi middle school and we all went into the big sort of um, uh, this big hall in the school and we sat cross-legged on the floor and we had this big black and white TV and we all watched the landing. Um, and so it was a really fantastic event. But anyway, 1969, July 1969, was the famous lunar landing. And um, here's a picture from the lunar landing. Um, and this is not like their suitcases as they head off to the Holiday Inn or whatever. Um, this is actually, these boxes are what's called retro reflectors. Retro reflectors are optical devices, optical instruments that reflect light reflect light back in the direction it came from. They reflect light back exactly in the direction the light came from. So it's not like a mirror. You know, shine light in a mirror and you're reflected off in all different directions according to the law of re reflection. These devices, if you shine light directly at it, it's going to shine light directly back at you. The reason for taking these to the moon is that we could shine light at them from Earth and the light would be reflected back to us. And we could measure the time it takes the light to travel from the Earth to the moon and back to us. And we, because we know the speed of light, we could determine how far, very precisely, how far away the moon is from us. By the time it takes the light ray to head to the moon, bounce off, bounce off the retro reflector, and head back to Earth. And so they did that with these re retro reflectors. The moon, we find, is spiraling away from the Earth. Nobody, nobody's told you that. Right? The moon is actually spiraling outwards from the Earth. Now, it's not going to leave us any time soon because the distance, the increase in radius of the uh, the moon's orbit is about four centimeters every year. But the U Earth, sorry, the moon is getting further away from the Earth every year by about four centimeters. It's spiraling away. And so they found this out with the retro reflectors. So, you know, they've been used, they're used in all sorts of engineering, but they also were used here for a scientific discovery. Okay. 
So this is a cartoon of a retro reflector. This one is a real re retro reflector is a three-dimensional object that has three mirrors. This is a two-dimensional cartoon with two mirrors, but it, it works the same way. So we're going to work with this one in understanding the re retro reflector. And the question here is um, light is directed into the retro reflector and comes out of the retro reflector. So here's the incoming ray downstairs. Here's the outgoing ray upstairs. The re re retro reflector itself, this two-dimensional one, is just two mirrors at right angles to one another. So there's a horizontal mirror here and there's a vertical mirror here. In a three-dimensional real retro reflector that we would take to the moon, there would be three mirrors that are perpendicularly per uh, that are mutually perpendicular to one another. But anyway, this is the kind of arrangement. And um, what we're going to do is determine the angle between this incoming light ray and this outgoing light ray. What we're going to discover, remarkably, is that the angle between the incoming light ray and the outgoing light ray is actually always 180 degrees no matter whether you change the direction of the incoming light ray. So maybe I could shine it down on this mirror more steeply. The light still comes back 180 degrees in the opposite direction. Maybe I could shine it on the bottom mirror more shallowly, if that's a word, like this. But the light would still come back 180 degrees. So no matter exactly how I strike the bottom mirror, the light coming off the, um, the vertical mirror always goes back in the opposite direction. So we're going to see how that works. And it's based on some geometry. It's based on the law of reflect, reflection. So we're going to explore that. OK. So the first thing I wanted to draw is the, here's the incident light ray. Here's the outgoing light ray. And this one we could call, say, the internal light ray. It's the light ray that travels from the first mirror that gets struck to the second mirror that gets struck. And I wanted to draw the various angles that are associated with the reflection of the first mirror and the reflection of the second mirror over here. So let me just explain that I'm really sort of introducing some language of some angles here. So I'm using the law of reflection downstairs here on the horizontal mirror, of course, and I'm using the law of reflection upstairs here on the vertical mirror, of course. These mirrors are at right angles, 90 degrees to each other. That's this little right angle here. And when this incident ray comes in, here's its incident angle, theta i, measured with respect to this vertical line, which is the normal for this reflection. And here's the reflected angle theta r, measured with respect to this normal. And so that's the reflection, and the law of reflection says these two angles are the same. So that's the important thing here. Theta i equals theta r. I've written it upstairs here. Then there's a second reflection on the vertical mirror. Now I call that the primed reflection, because we're going to have another pair of incident and reflected angles. And um, Here's the ref incident angle for the second reflection, theta prime i, or theta i prime. Again, it's measured with respect to the normal for this mirror, so this is the horizontal red line here. And here's the reflected angle. It's theta r prime, or theta prime r. And um, again, these two angles obey the law of reflection, so these two angles are e equal to one another theta prime i equals theta prime r. I wrote it up here too. And so that was my starting point as I got this kind of like warm up, warming up, you know. Um, I'm warming up by drawing the light rays and adding to the picture the, um, the, the angles that are relevant to the two reflections. So the two incident angles and the two reflected angles. Well, we're interested in the deflection of the light ray from its original path. I said that magically, not really magically, and not really mis mystically, but through the law of reflection, we're going to find that the light ray is deflected 
in such a way that it goes back where it came from. So that means we're going to find that the total deflection of the light ray is actually 180 degrees. It got turned around. It got reversed. So we're going to want to find the total deflection of the light ray. And I'm going to call that the Greek D delta. That total deflection occurs due to two individual separate deflections. There's the deflection at the bottom mirror, the horizontal one, deflection at the vertical mi mirror, the, the one on the right side. And so this delta one here, this is the first deflection. See, the light ray was traveling down and towards the right, and now it's traveling up and towards the right. This angle here that I marked in red, this is important, this is the um, measured from the original direction to the new direction. This is the deflection angle. Delta 1 is the deflection angle. I've done the same thing upstairs here for the second reflection. Like the light ray was traveling up and towards the uh, right. It strikes the mirror and now it's traveling up and towards the left. So it got deflected here too. It was traveling in the direction of this dash gray line, and now it's traveling in the direction of this black arrow here. This angle in red here is the change in direction. This is the deflection again. It's measured from the direction it was heading to the direction it's now heading. And I've called that delta 2. So that's, that's introducing the new characters in this as well as the theta i's and theta r's. There's two more characters, which are the delta 1 and delta 2, that are going to play a role, of this, a role in this problem, because they are literally the deflections that we're trying to map out for the retro reflector. Now, I can write an equation for the deflection on the lower mirror and the deflection on the upper mirror in terms of these, these angles of incidence and angles of reflection. So, look, if, the, if at this lower mirror, the light ray was to go back in the opposite direction, suppose that happened, that doesn't happen, but supposing it just had it headed back this way, that would be a 180 degree deflection. It doesn't go back where it came from, it goes back in another direction that is 180 degrees less this angle and less this angle. So this deflection is 180 degrees, the complete reversal, less the incident angle and less the reflected angle gives this angle here. So that's a little bit of geometry. I hope that's fine. Same idea up here, right? This deflection here, delta 2, at the second mirror, the vertical mirror, we can write in terms of um, the, the incident and reflected angles at the second mirror. So, so let's see if we can do that. Um, the light ray was traveling along this upwards to the right line here. If it was headed, if it was sent straight back, which it doesn't get sent straight back, it would go back along that line. But rather than going back along that line, instead of going 180 degrees the opposite direction, it goes 180 degrees less this angle, the incident angle, less this angle, the reflected angle. So if I subtract these two angles of 180 degrees, which I'm doing here, you get the, uh, the second deflection. Well, this is the key to solving this problem. We've written out the um, deflections at the two mirrors in terms of the incident angles and um, reflected angles. And if we add those two deflections, we're going to be able to figure out the total deflection. So that's the plan. There's one more thing I want to show you that will be helpful in the calculation. There's a triangle in this picture. So this is like the magic triangle that allows you to solve this problem. There's a triangle in the picture that has one corner at the first reflection, a second corner at the second reflection, and then this corner here that's made by the vertical and the horizontal, the two normals. This is a right angle triangle, so there's 90 degrees here. You know a triangle has 180 degrees, so the remaining 90 degrees are spread between this angle downstairs, this angle upstairs. That means that theta r plus theta i prime 
they must add up to 90 degrees. So that's a bit of geometry of this retro reflector. And that's a key bit of geometry that, and I've written it here, theta i prime, this angle in the triangle, theta r, this angle in the triangle downstairs here, must, must add up to 90 degrees because this is a right angle triangle. Okay. That picture on the screen now is all we need all we need to be able to solve for the deflection delta. All we need to do now is to calculate the deflection delta is to add up delta 1 and delta 2. We're going to add up those two delta 1s and delta 2s that I've written equations for here. And as we add them up, we're going to use these two facts that we've exposed. They're obeying the law of reflection. So theta i equals theta r, theta i prime equals theta r prime. And also, the theta r is related to the um, theta i prime. The sum of those two is 90 degrees. That's a bit of geometry of the re retro reflector. OK, so here's my calculation then. Really, th this is me reproducing the picture. All the work is in making the picture. If you got this far in solving this problem, that's all the work. The total deflection is the sum of the two individual deflections. So delta equals delta 1 plus delta 2. There's a deflection downstairs here, deflection on the right here. If you add them up, you're going to get the total deflection. We wrote equations for these deflections in terms of the incident and reflected angles. There was this equation upstairs here in terms of the incident and reflected angles of the, set, the, the vertical mirror, the one downstairs for the incident and reflected angles of the, uh, the horizontal mirror. So I just plugged in those equations. Nothing else there. Just plugging in the equation for delta 1, plugging in the equation for delta 2. Now I've got an equation for delta that looks complicated because it's got four angles in it. So it looks pretty complicated. I now it's like I made a mess in the kitchen. I've got four angles in the equation. I've made a mess in the equation, but we can simplify it with those two ideas. These, these equations obey the law of reflection, and the theta, theta r and theta i prime, prime are, are in a right angle triangle and related to one another. So I'm going to plug those two facts in. Firstly, I'm going to use the law of reflection. I'm going to replace theta, theta i in terms of theta r. So this theta i becomes a theta r because of the law of reflection. I'm going to replace this theta r prime with theta i prime. Uh, this also becomes a theta i prime because of the law of reflection. If you do that, you get this little equation here. So that's just plugging in the law of reflection. We've made it simpler. But look. Theta i prime plus theta r, so that's this angle upstairs on the right, this angle downstairs on the left, and their sum is 90 degrees. So this little guy here is nothing other than 90 degrees, so I can just plug in 90 degrees. So I get 360 degrees minus 2 times 90 degrees, 180 degrees. I've just discovered, I don't know who first discovered this, but no matter what the incident angle is, so whether the incident angle is, I don't know, 45 degrees, 1 degree, 99 degrees, you know, 30 degrees, 60 degrees, no matter what your incident angle, you always get the same deflection of 180 degrees. The light always comes back where it began, where it started from. And that's that's the amazing thing about a retro reflector. That's why we can shine light at the moon and reflect the light back towards us with the retro reflectors. Anyway, that's how we measured, that's the story of how we measured that the moon is spiraling away from Earth. It's the story of why they left retro reflectors on the surface of the moon when they first, you know, you could imagine, I'm going to go to the moon for the first time. What do I want to take? Uh, binoculars or something? No, I'm going to take retro reflectors because I can measure how far away the moon is. Fantastic idea. Okay. Second example. So this is a, a natural, a natural phenomenon. It's a natural atmospheric phenomenon. So we're now getting in touch with nature. 
Um, if you look at the moon at night, you might notice you might notice that around the moon is actually a ring. It's a bright ring around the moon. If you don't do this, but if you were to look at the sun, you would notice that around the sun there's also a bright ring around the sun. So if you look at the moon, there's a halo around the moon, a halo of moonlight. And if you look at the sun, the, well, don't look at the sun. If you don't look at the sun, there's a, the, a halo of uh, sunlight around the sun. Now, the, the halo around the moon uh, is, is like a circle that an corresponds to an angle of 20, 22 degrees. When you view it, you see it at an angle of 22 two degrees away from the center of the moon. Um, the halo around the, the sun is also at 22 degrees. When you view the halo from the sun, it's at 22 degrees. So the sun and the moon have halos. Why do they have halos? They have halos because the atmosphere, the atmosphere is not just air. The atmosphere it has water in the atmosphere, has water droplets, for example. It has, has actually ice crystals in the air. And ice crystals have a certain geometry. They're like little um, prisms, and they're floating around in the air. And those little ice crystals, those little prisms, they're 60-degree prisms. We'll see one soon. 60-degree um, prisms that um, refract, bend the light rays. And the minimum angle that they bend the light rays is this 22 degrees. So when you see the moon, in the um, sky, you see the sun in the sky. You can see the moonlight sunlight directly, but it comes straight towards you. But you can also see it at that sunlight and moonlight at this angle of 20 degrees, 22 degrees, this halo. And that's where it's not getting to you directly, but rather it's been refracted off um, ice crystals in the, um, in the air, off these 60 degree prisms that are in the air. And so this is where this comes from. So we're gonna try and understand that, that natural phenomenon. So this is an example of, of refraction. That's why I'm, I'm doing this, just in case you're worried. So this is the physics behind what's going on. So this is like an ice crystal, a corner of an ice crystal. And I said these ice crystals are 60-degree prisms. And so this, this is literally a 60-degree prism. Imagine this is a block of ice uh, in this triangular shape. And at each corner is 60 degrees. This is a 60 degree ice prism. The refractive index of ice, I don't know if I mentioned it, uh, water was 1.33, ice is 1.31. <clears throat> the minimum, the smallest refraction of light, which is bending, of light, when it travels through a prism, this 60 degree prism, is when the light travels horizontally or parallel to this edge here. So I'm just telling you this. I'm not proving this, but this is the geometry for the minimum, the minimum bending of a light ray that travels through the prism. If, you, if, you, if the light ray travels through the prism in some other direction, it's always bent more. So this is the minimum that the light can get bent through the prism. And this, this minimum bending of the light ray, you see it was going up and towards the right, and now it's going down and towards the right, so it was bent. This minimum bending of the light ray is, um, is actually the 22 degrees. So this is where the 22 degree halo comes from. It comes from light from the moon, light from the sun, passing through ice crystals in this particular geometry here. So it's an amazing thing. So what we're going to do, because we now understand refraction, we now understand Snell's law of reflection, is we're going to calculate the deflection of this light ray as it travels through the crystal. It's refracted or bent here, it's refracted or bent over here on the right. And we're going to determine these two deflections of the light ray, add these two deflections up and determine the 22 degree halo. Oh. Okay, so there's a few geometrical and refraction steps in this. 
And so I'm going to just show you a few pictures that help us work through figuring out, work through calculating the um, uh, deflection. And so um, this is the first one. And um, we're going to start tracing out the path of the light ray. And we're going to start figuring out the deflection of the light ray. I'm going to do this for the left-hand side. So we're going to figure out how much the light is deflected on the left. The calculation for the right-hand side is exactly the same. So I'm not going to go into the details on the right-hand side. I'm just going to say at the end that the right-hand side deflection is the same as the left-hand side deflection. And so the total deflection is the sum of the left and the right, or it's just twice the left, it's just twice the right. I'm not going to bother with the details on the right-hand side. OK. So, so here comes the light ray passing through the crystal, and we're going to focus on this left-hand side. We actually know the reflected, the, sorry, the refracted angle over here. And we know it because of geometry. It's this face at 60 degrees to the horizontal, but it's a, this angle here is also 60 degrees. This horizontal here is 60 degrees away from this edge. So if this is 60 degrees, then this must be 30 degrees because this line is at 90 degrees to this surface. So this is just a bit of geometry that this must be 30 if this is 60 because the sum of the two must add to 90. So that's a bit of geometry. And from that little bit of geometry, I've figured out what the refracted angle is in this particular case. So I, I do know the refracted angle from the geometry of the 60-degree prism. Next step. Now I know the refracted angle. Now I know the refracted angle, I'm going to calculate the um, incident angle. So that's the angle over here. Well, look, this is refraction. This process going on here is refraction. And so this, this process here obeys the law of refraction. And so if I know the refracted angle, and I know the refractive indices of these two different materials, then I can calculate this incident angle with Snell's law. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going from air that has a refractive index that is essentially 1, as good as 1 for this problem, to ice, which has a refractive index of 1.31. So I know the two refractive indices of the two materials. I know the refracted angle is theta r. The only thing I don't know is the incident angle, theta i. And so if I look upstairs here, this is Snell's law, that the product of the refractive indices and the signs of the angles are equal in the two different media. If I know um, the two refractive indices and I know the refracted angle, the only thing I don't know is theta i. And so I can solve for three, theta i. So I plugged in the two refractive indices. It's 1 on the left. It's 1.31 on the right. I plugged in the angle the refracted angle is 30 degrees. I'm going to figure out the incident angle. I can figure out the sine of the incident angle is 0.65 with Snell's law. And if I take the inverse sine of the arc sine, I get 40.9 degrees. And so this is the refracted angle here. Sorry, this is the incident angle here. So I know, know these two angles here. Next step. This is the last step in solving this problem, really. If I know the incident angle of the light ray, and I know the refracted angle of the light ray, I can figure out how much the light ray is deflected as it travels through this, 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 um, this surface here, from the air to the ice. So the light ray was bent, right? It was traveling to the right and upwards, and then it becomes traveling to the right horizontally. So it gets bent, and here's the angle by which it's bent by. This dashed line here is the original path of the light ray. This horizontal line here is the new path of the light ray. The angle between these two paths 
is the deflection. So I called it delta left because it's the deflection on the left-hand side. And it's simply, if you look at it here, it's the difference between this angle, 40.9 degrees, and this angle here of 30 degrees. Um, this is 40.9 degrees in here also, between the dashed line and the red line, is 40.9 degrees. And so this angle is truly the difference between those two. And so this angle is 10.9 degrees. So we figured that when the light ray went in the ice crystal, it got refracted, it got bent, and we've actually figured from geometry and law of refraction how much it got bent, how much it got refracted. It was 10.9 degrees. The same thing happens over on the other side. So there's a 10.9 degrees when the light ray comes out. If you wanted to calculate it, it's exactly the same procedure. That means that the total, the total diff the total bending of the, the light is going to be the sum of these two 10.9 degrees. And so that is where the 22 degrees comes from. It's actually 21.8 degrees. It's the sum of the first deflection, the second deflection gives us the 22 degrees. And so that's, that's why we see a halo around the, the moon. We see a halo around the sun. It's the minimum bending of the light rays when light rays go through ice crystals. And so that's where the halos come from. I want to show you, just to end up with, a demonstration. If you, next time you look at moonlight, look at the halo, you'll see that it actually has colors to it. And the colors come about. Here's an example of the colors. This is actually, what you're seeing on the screen is light being directed onto, this is a 60 degree prism. The light is shone through the prism. It's being refracted. It's being bent. This is the 22 degrees bending of the light rays through the prism. And what you're seeing here is that 22 degrees, that's approximately 22 degrees. Different colors of light have different refractive indices. That's called dispersion. Different colors of light are bent different amounts. The white light that we're shining on the prism is spread out into a rainbow. And if you look at these halos in the sky, you'll see them as rainbows. You'll see different colors on the inside of the halo, on the outside of the halo, because the different refractive indices for the different colors of light